Before I get going, I got a little disclaimer here about the title of the video. Don't read too much into it. Uh, videos on YouTube need to have a bit of a hyperbolic title to attract people and get them to click on the video. So you now take it with a grain of salt. Now, also before I get going here, I want to propose a bit of an experiment that you can do at home right now, um, assuming that you have the stuff to do it, which you should, because if you're watching this video, you're probably into audio. Take uh, your best set of headphones or earbuds or whatever. They don't have to be great. Just whatever ones you have. Put those in, put those on, play some music and walk around. Walk into your bedroom, walk into your living room, walk into your bathroom, then go outdoors. And in each of these locations, have a listen to what you're hearing. Okay, see if you can hear any differences other than the, the noise that might be in the environment around you. Okay, even go into your car or whatever you drive and have a listen there and, and take note of the sound and, you know, whether you can hear a difference. Now do the same thing again with a pair of speakers. Now, once again, they don't have to be great speakers. They can be a little pair of computer speakers that are uh, self-amplified, get a little music player to play them through and set those up in your bedroom or in the living room or in the bathroom or take them outdoors or bring them out to your car and listen to how they sound and take note of whether they sound different. Now I'm gonna assume that most of you don't actually have to do that. You already know that there's gonna be very little, if any, change when wearing the uh, headphones or earbuds and there's going to be a pretty wide difference a really remarkable difference when you move those speakers from room to room and then again outdoors you're going to hear a big difference and that illustrates the point that speakers rely on the space that they're in to produce the sound that they're making you can't divorce the two. You can't say this speaker is going to sound great because it has flat frequency response and great off axis response when you don't know the room that it's going to be put in. In order to establish what the sound quality is going to be, you have to take those speakers and set them up in the room and actually listen to them. And then you can judge whether they sound great or not. These days, there's this concept of the typical room. And in reality, there's no such thing as a typical room. Uh, rooms are built differently. The most obvious one is the size of the room, the width, the length, the height. Uh, the next thing is the density of the walls, you know, what they're made from and how reflective or absorbent they are. Uh, take my workshop here, for example, the walls are made from, uh, you know, drywall and uh, wood studs and it's got insulation in there. But for the most part, uh, lower frequencies will go right through this wall. These walls that surround me, they'll go right through it, the lowest base. So it tends not to become a reflective problem or a buildup problem in the room. So I have room modes in here, yes, but they're not going to be as strong as a room that has really reflective walls like block or, or solid concrete. If you have solid concrete walls, they're going to reflect all of the sound back. They're going to let very little and it's going to be the very lowest base, like below 20 hertz. Usually it depends upon the thickness of the wall. All of it's going to be reflected back into the room and all of it's going to be bouncing around inside the room unless you have something that's going to absorb it. So this changes the character of what you're listening to. And you'll notice that when you move your speakers from room to room, you'll hear a difference. So even though flat frequency response is a good target for the speaker builder or designer to shoot for, they want to make it as flat as they possibly can, it becomes less important when you put those speakers in a room. What you're dealing with then is a system. You're dealing with the speakers operating inside a space and you can't divorce the two. Like I said, it's going to affect the frequency range that you're 
going to get at your listening position. That's why it becomes important that you adopt, you know, a measurement system where you can do some basic measurements. And at, you know, at, at this point in history, there's really no excuse. The software, REW is free and the microphones are relatively cheap and easy to set up. You just plug them into the USB port. The software recognizes it, you put it in the calibration file and away you go. You don't even need the calibration file that much to measure frequency response. That's just for SPL. I need to break in here real quick because I know that the Sheldon Cooper types out there are saying that the calibration file affects the frequency response as well. And yes, it does, but to a, a degree that is not of significance to what you're doing here. When you're looking at the frequency response in a room, as far as room measurements go, it's going to be very rough. It's not going to be perfect. So you're looking for big problems. You're not looking for small deviations. And that's the reason why you can use an uncalibrated mic for these measurements instead of one that's calibrated. And there's lots of tutorials out there to show you how to do it. So measuring the frequency response of the system, the speaker system in the room is what will give you the best sound quality. It will at least what you're shooting for. It'll tell you if there's big problems there, if there are big holes in the response because the speakers are playing in a room. And then the other thing about flat frequency response is that people will say, well, if it's flat to start with, you can always EQ it to suit your you know, preferences. Well, the same is true if it's not flat. If the speaker is say down a little bit at 2K and up a little bit at 5K, you can equalize that so that it makes it more flat. And this is where measurements, actual in-room measurements will be a big help. Because at the end of the day, what you have with speakers in the same price range is not much variability. Uh, you know, speaker A and speaker B are going to be very similar in the same price range. If you go above the price range or below the price range, you're going to see a little bit more variability. But, you know, this is nothing that can't be fixed with room equalization. And especially if you want to take it even further, like if you really want best sound quality, start doing some room treatment. That's going to give you the biggest gain. So you can take your new speakers that you just bought that the guy on YouTube said were awesome, measured nice and flat, put them in your room. They sound mediocre. And you can improve that by starting to do some effective room treatment to improve the sound quality overall. And I know what you're thinking. Here he goes again, talking about room treatment. This is something that I can't do in my room. I just need a pair of speakers that are going to work in there. Well, this is the problem right here. People are looking for easy answers. They think the easy answers lie in the flat frequency response and the good off axis response and the predicted in room response where it you know predicts what the response will be in a typical room. But we've already established that there isn't a typical room. So your, your response is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be anywhere near it. The only way to get near perfect response, at least represented by those measurements, those anechoic measurements, is to make your room more anechoic. So it cuts down on the reverb time and the reflections that mess up and screw up the frequency response.